First of all, let's get one thing straight. He had never wanted to be a police officer. All the way through school, while the other boys were playing Guardi e Ladri, or Cops and Robbers in English, he had been inside reading. Forget playing games about criminals and pretending you're in a 50s movie. The man had always been obsessed with all things ancient, artifacts and archaeology. That was where his imagination lived. And yet now, he is one of them, a police officer, standing in a sweltering uniform under the baking Italian sun, staring at fishing boats through a pair of binoculars. Just get a degree in Latin and move to Rome. You'll be a historian in no time. What could be easier? Yeah, right. After two years of job searching, he'd given up. The police were hiring and said they liked the look of him. What they'd failed to explain was that he'd be trained in the Polizia Provinciale. His primary duties? Enforcing regional fishing laws. The man sighs and lowers his binoculars. The job wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the uniform. Who was Eugenio who thought that a black uniform would be a good idea in this heat? The police officer's walkie-talkie crackles. Someone's requesting him specifically. He doesn't recognize the voice. Must be a mistake or another prank. He's definitely running out of patience for those. It is his job, though. He pushes the button down and responds. Reports of a dangerous individual wandering around in central Rome, near the Colosseum, threatening members of the public and acting erratically. The police officer replies, checking they've got the right person. What's this got to do with fishing law? He isn't even in Rome right now. It'll take him almost an hour to drive back to the city. There's a pause from the other end, then the voice crackles back through. You speak Latin, right? It was only a little thing, but it annoys the police officer for the whole drive back to Rome, his beat-up hatchback winding its way through the traffic with a siren blaring. You don't speak Latin. No one speaks it. It's a dead language. You study it, you read it, you can write it, you can speak it if you want, but no one speaks Latin like they speak Italian. Nice to use the siren for once, though. But sure enough, as he pulls up the handbrake, parking down a crowded side street, thank God for Polizia parking privileges, the voice he can hear yelling from nearby does appear to be speaking in Latin. The man must be very agitated. The officer can hear the shouts quite clearly even through his rolled-up windows. It doesn't take long at all to locate the disturbance. Polizia vehicles, much shinier and bigger than his own, block off the entrance to the square. Officers with colorful berets stand shoulder to shoulder, blocking off members of the public and tourists who all swarm close, trying to get an eye on the commotion. The police officer wearily pushes his way through the throng. The officers blocking the way smirk at his uniform and point at his car parked down the road. The longer he tries to persuade them to let him through, the more he feels like he's being pranked. Until suddenly, a senior officer with an even more colorful beret appears behind them and barks for them to let him through. The constable leads the police officer through the row of cars and into the square. It's mostly deserted. A few officers armed with tasers stand nervously in front of the various cafes and gelaterias. But everyone has eyes only for the man in the middle of the square. Brandishing a shovel, the man is yelling at the top of his voice. He swings it wildly at any little movement, and every few seconds looks down at his body in a state of total confusion. His face contorts constantly, fluctuating between savagery and utter fear. What is most strange about this man, however, is what is sitting on his head, an ancient Roman centurion's helmet. The police officer recognizes the helmet almost straight away. He remembers it from one of his textbooks at university. It looks to be one from the Marian reforms, roughly 100 years BCE. Go on, talk to him, the constable hisses in the police officer's ear. He's speaking Latin, isn't he? Speak to him. Sure enough, the crazed man is speaking Latin. His accent is rough, but totally natural. The words flow from his mouth as if he's been speaking the language all his life. But that wouldn't make sense. No one speaks Latin. The police officer steps forward and clears his throat. A megaphone is shoved into his hand. He raises it to his mouth and speaks into it. Immediately, the crazed man turns towards him and starts brandishing the shovel, wild panic distorting his face. The officer instinctively lowers the megaphone. The man's eyes follow the device. That was clearly a non-starter. The officer slowly lowers it to the ground and raises his hands, palms out to the man. He tries again. His Latin is rusty, very rusty, but he manages to introduce himself. The man's eyes meet his. The shovel stops swinging for a moment. When he speaks, his voice is a notch calmer. Only a notch. Publius Cartifilius Aetius, Roman centurion, hero of the Yogotine War. I serve under the command of the consul Gaius Marius. The police officer lets out a long breath. This is going to be an interesting day. 
He isn't sure what kind of drugs this grad student has been taking, but this level of delusion can't have just come from one too many all-nighters in the university library. The officer, hands still raised, holds eye contact with the man. He politely explains that Consul Gaius Marius is not here right now in what must be very formal Latin. That only seems to distress the man. He swings the shovel wildly round again, pointing it at the ruins of the Colosseum standing proudly over him. What has happened to my city? Which barbarous nation is responsible? I will slay every newborn male and have the mother stitch their scalps into a cloak. I shall wear it as I parade the streets of their capital. Maybe slight overkill. It was mostly just a few earthquakes that had toppled the Colosseum. Not entirely sure who he could take that up with. God, maybe? But the Romans had already had a go at slaying his offspring. What is so confusing about this man finally registers with the police officer. Well, aside from the obvious. The man is dressed in modern clothes. He talks like an ancient Roman, brandishes a shovel like a sword, is wearing a centurion's helmet, and yet, from the neck down, he's dressed in khakis and a polo shirt. The police officer asks the man where he's come from this morning. The man looks stumped by the question. The more he thinks about it, the more agitated he seems to become. The officer is about to divert the man's attention when he spies a pair of military police personnel approaching the man from behind, tasers at the ready. The officer cries out a warning, but it's too late. The barbs sink into the man's flesh, and the current flows through him. His muscles seize up, his body convulses, and he collapses to the ground. A sea of dark uniforms descend on him, obscuring him from view. All that can be heard are his screams. Several hours pass before the police officer gets a call back on his walkie-talkie. He spends the afternoon checking in with the station repeatedly about the strange man's situation. Before long, his requests are met with radio silence. But that evening, just as he is finishing up his shift, a call comes through. It is brief and tired sounding, but it tells him what he needs to know. The man is being held in a station nearby. By the time the police officer sits down across from the centurion again, it's clear that the man is exhausted. Bruises cover his arms, his lip is busted, and he has a nasty swelling pushing against the inside of his helmet. Apparently, the guards had tried to remove the helmet earlier, but the man had grown so violent that they decided it wasn't worth the effort. Where did you get that helmet? The officer asks, nodding to it. Barracks Commander Quintus Sextus Caiso gave it to me. That wasn't particularly helpful. The officer racks his brains, trying to think of how to get through to this man. He notices the soldier across from him keeps glancing up at the ceiling. He follows the man's eyeline and realizes he must be looking at the fluorescent tube light flickering slightly above them. The soldier is muttering something under his breath about dark magic. The police officer tries to explain that the light is essentially just a different kind of oil lamp. The soldier snorts derisively. He knows a cursed object when he sees it. Cursed object? The police officer studies the helmet more closely. It can't be a replica. There's no way. The nicks on the sides, the rusting around the edges, the oxidation of the bronze elements. It looks utterly authentic to what a 100 BCE helmet should look like. You've told me where you got your helmet. Where did you get your clothes? The soldier stops grumbling. His jaw clenches slightly. He does not answer for a long time. When he does, his voice has lost some of its bravado from before. These garments are not my own. I awoke wearing them. This body… The officer can piece together the rest of the sentence without the man saying it. This delusion must be running so deep that the man is completely disassociated from his own body. Then, all of a sudden, the soldier starts talking. He talks for several minutes without stopping for breath or interjections. At times, his voice swells with pride. At other times, it cowers with fear. But he speaks with a clarity and determination that goes beyond delusion. However impossible it may seem, the police officer has no choice but to believe that the man sitting across from him was, in fact, Publius Cartifilius Aetius. He'd fought in the Jugurtine War, a battle which the Romans had won, capturing King Jugurtha. Publius had been one of the centurions tasked with escorting the captured king back to Rome in chains. The soldiers had all drawn lots to determine who'd be on guard duty on which night. Publius had drawn the shortest straw and ended up guarding the king on the last night. The night of the Triumphus. The police officer took a second to remember what the Triumphus was. After a battle, on the final night, the Romans would throw a huge party celebrating their victory. While all of the other soldiers were out drinking and sleeping with the local women, Publius stayed up all night watching the king in silence. The king spent the night trying to bribe him, persuade him, flatter him, say anything to try and win his freedom. When nothing worked, the king grew frustrated, then angry. In a spitting rage, he started to curse the centurion. 
The soldier recounts the curse word for word to the police officer, who sits in stunned silence. A chill comes over the room as he speaks. Spirits of the underworld, I consecrate and hand over to you, if you have any power, Publius Cartifilius Aetius. Whatever he does, may it all turn to ash. Spirits of the netherworld, I consecrate to you his limbs, his head, his shadow, his brain, his mouth, his nose, his speech, his breath, his liver, his heart, his lungs, his intestines, his stomach, his arms, his hands, his knees, his calves, his heels, his toes. Spirits of the netherworld, if I see him wasting away, I swear that I will be delighted to offer a sacrifice to you, a king's sacrifice. Publius punched the king square in the face, but a sense of unease came over him over the coming days. As the king was dragged through the streets of Rome, humiliated publicly and executed, he had remained utterly calm, staring at Publius whenever he had the chance. Desperate to clear his mind, Publius went out drinking with his fellow soldiers. They had a raucous night, feasting, sleeping around, steadily losing consciousness, until Publius passed out in an alleyway. The centurion stops talking. His hands begin to shake, and his face contorts again. The police officer waits patiently, but the man does not continue his story. A single tear streams down the man's cheek, followed by a second on the other side. Then suddenly, both eyes are streaming, and he is shaking uncontrollably. A guttural cry fills the room. The police officer reaches across the table to take the soldier's hand. It's the wrong move. The soldier jerks back away from him, straining at the handcuffs holding him to the table. Panic fills his face again, the same panic that had torn at his face in the square earlier that day. He lunges for the police officer to attack him. At that moment, the door bursts open and a group of men charge in, restraining the soldier. They push the police officer back so hard he falls on the floor. These men aren't dressed in polizia uniforms at all. They're wearing totally unremarkable black suits. One of them removes the helmet from the man's head and shoves it into a containment box with the words SCP Foundation printed on the side. The others restrain the man, but he suddenly stopped resisting. In a daze, the man looks around the room, his face utterly bewildered but harmless. There's no fight left in him, no soldier. The police officer clamors to his feet and approaches the man. Publius, are you okay? The police officer says in Latin. The man stares blankly back at him. Where the hell am I? He says in perfect Italian. That helmet, referred to herein as SCP-1510, now lives in a much more secure box in the artifact containment section of Site-19. In order to prevent the helmet from rusting or undergoing any significant wear, it is kept in a waterless environment. The layer of blue-green oxidized bronze is not to be removed, as it acts as a protective layer for the unoxidized bronze underneath. As the police officer observed, the helmet bears no distinctive features at all that would distinguish it from any other artifact helmets from the same era. The notable exception, of course, being that the helmet is inhabited by the former centurion Publius Cartifilius Aetius, also known as SCP-1510-1. When the helmet is placed on one's head, the wearer's consciousness and body will be taken over by the soldier, who gains total control over their motor functions, thoughts, feelings, everything. However, this effect is not universal. Only males can be affected by SCP-1510, and they have to be aged between 28 and 35. It is theorized that this is to approximate the age and gender of SCP-1510-1 when he was alive in ancient Rome. Historical accounts seem to verify the account that this SCP gives of its life. While there are obviously few records remaining of 107 BCE, those that do exist align with his version of events, and nothing it has reported during interview sessions have seemed historically inaccurate as of yet. Interview sessions are held using D-Class personnel who don the helmet. While no noticeable long-term effects have been observed from wearing the helmet, long-term studies on the health consequences are ongoing. Initial interviews proved futile. SCP-1510-1 was immediately distressed at the point of aggression and violence for the first five sessions, attempting to attack the interviewers and fight its way out of the containment facility. However, upon the commencement of Interview 7, SCP-1510-1 was noticeably calmer. After apologizing for its previous behavior, the SCP was willing and able to share its life story and how it found its way into the head of a grave robber in modern-day Italy. The first part of the story is the same as that told to our police officer earlier, the point where SCP-1510-1 grew upset and violent with the police officer roughly corresponds to the ending of interview log SCP-1510-1-6, where the SCP requested a break to gather its thoughts. The next day, during interview number 7, 
the SCP told the rest of its story. It awoke in the alleyway after an indeterminate amount of time, still inhabiting the body of Publius Cartifilius Aetius. However, that body was now a corpse, having died in the street from unknown causes, possibly alcohol poisoning, choking on vomit, or a head injury. In a state of distress, SCP-1510-1 was conscious as its body rotted away, fully sentient and aware of everything that was happening as its body deteriorated before its failing eyes. The corpse was soon discovered by a pair of local beggars who, noticing it was still alive, summoned a Haruspex. A Haruspex was a person trained in the art of divination who would study the entrails of deceased animals to find meaning. Upon examining and cutting apart the corpse of Publius Cartifilius Aetius, the Haruspex concluded that the body was marked by the Furies and was a herald of tyranny reborn. The beggars quickly carried the body away and buried it outside of the city in an unused grave. SCP-1510-1 describes the experience that followed as a kind of… fading. The helmet remained on the body, but the body deteriorated over time, steadily sapping the SCP of any sensations or stimuli. It appears the helmet needs a host in order to see, hear, smell, taste, and otherwise react or interact with the world. Removed from a host, it enters what it refers to as darkness, a time where it hovers between consciousness and unconsciousness, aware and thinking, but simultaneously resting in a kind of void, unable to observe the world or interact with it. For over 2,000 years, SCP-1510 remained in this state, until a sudden awakening. A grave robber in Italy, the man brandishing a shovel in khakis and polo who ended up sitting confused in the police station, was responsible. Local police interviews reveal that the man has a history of digging around Rome and across Italy, looking for ancient artifacts to sell off to the highest bidder. Upon discovering SCP-1510, this man had proudly put the helmet onto his head, not realizing the effect that it would have on him. Almost instantaneously, the man's body was taken over by SCP-1510-1, who, after centuries of darkness, now suddenly found itself in the bustling heart of Italy's biggest city. Electric lights, smartphones, cars, sirens, tourists, everywhere SCP-1510-1 looked, it saw technology totally alien and otherworldly, overlaid and built into a city it had once known. In a state of utter panic, the SCP grabbed the nearest weapon it could find, the shovel used to excavate it, and started to attack those around it. Not exactly the best wake-up call. Nowadays, however, SCP-1510-1 is highly cooperative, having had time to process the world that it has awoken into and the loss of the world it left behind, it holds on to a soldier-like sense of duty. SCP-1510-1 still worships the ancient Roman gods and as such, believes earnestly that Jupiter and Juno have a hand in keeping it alive. It has explained to interviewers on multiple occasions that there must be a purpose behind its continued existence and that it is keen to work with SCP personnel in any way it can so as to achieve that purpose. While still being held in Latin, conversations with SCP-1510-1 are positive and at times jovial. It has a keen memory of its life in ancient Rome and can give very valuable insight into events that occurred at the time. This gives the Foundation vital intelligence in uncovering and tracing the origins of further SCPs that were theorized to have been present during the Yugurtine War in what is present-day Algeria. If you want to support this important mission while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2678, A City All of Blood, for another haunting Italian anomaly. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.